Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Kenya recording of the film The Stolen Country of Mine, playing as part of the 12th European Union Human Rights Film Base. I'm here with Mark Wise today. Hi Mark, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Greetings to Istanbul. Yeah, and greetings to you too, and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, before we started to talk, I just want to give some information about uh, Mark. Uh, he was born in Dortmund in 1966, has been making documentaries for 25 years, and is a member of Federal Association of Directors. He has worked in many conflict areas around the world and has non won numerous international awards for his films, which include Kanun, Picture of Nepal Girl, Camp 14, and We Hold the Line. So is there anything else uh, you might want to add to this? No, it's fine. Thanks. Okay, so we can start to talk about the stolen country of mine. Uh, I just wanted to start by uh, asking you, how did you decide to do this project? And uh, uh, how was uh, the process of shooting this documentary? Well, the, the whole project started with a personal friend of mine. And yeah. he's a doctor. And he worked and lived for several years in the middle of the rainforest. It's not in the Sarayaku area, which we have in the film. It's at the Rio Napo behind Coca. So he lived there for around six years in a little village in the middle of the jungle. And after he returned, he went back to visit his families. Let me name it like that. You know, his friends. Mm -hmm. And one day he came back from Ecuador and he said, Mark, we have to drink coffee together. And he began to tell me the story that they are in the middle of the rainforest. I mean, you have to realize there's no street, there's no infrastructure, there's nothing. Yeah. And he said, but there are hundreds of Chinese workers working and there are caterpillars and stuff like that. So, but in that days, the government of Rafael Correa, the, in that days, actual president was very restrictive to journalists, especially critical journalists. There was a colleague from Newsweek, US colleague, and he was um, arrested on the Rio Napo as he tried to go into the area and thrown out of the country. So, um, but my friend told me that he would go with another delegation of several doctors and professors into the region. So I said, okay, I can be an assistant doctor. And so we did it like that. Nobody had a slight idea that I'm a filmmaker. And, and then we got a speedboat by the Catholic bishop of Coca. And that was the second thing which was very helpful. Because any soldier, policeman on the river saw, oh, it's, it's the boat of the bishop and let us pass. Mm -hmm. And so I could see it and realized, wow, they are really working here. They are really starting preparation to explore oil in the middle of the Yazuni, which was a, or is a national park. It's strictly forbidden. Yeah? And then a source gave me the first package of 500 original contracts between oil company, China, Petro, Ecuador, state oil company, banks, governments, everything was confidential. So. In a way, I got the very soon the impression this is much bigger than just Yazuni. It's a whole country. And my assistant director, he's a director on his own in Ecuador, the most famous director for documentaries, and Carlos Andres Vera. And he told me about the story of Fernando. So I said, hey, I want to meet him. He said, that's not possible because he's living in safe houses underground. So the first time I met Veronica, his wife, it was very impressive because, for example, she told me we cannot visit, meet in my apartment because it. I mean, there are all there are microphones of the Secret Service all around of the state. You know, she was yeah. she was taped. Her whole life was taped. So the the kids, for example, the children, it was forbidden for the children to name the father because uh, Veronica was afraid that they would, in a way, say, oh, daddy is in that and that house. So it was, they never talked about the father at home. And so I sent messages to Fernando. And I mean, from time to time, he had access to internet. 
And I said, check Cam 14, and he did it, and he said, okay, let's do it. I'm working with you. But it needed something like one, one and a half years more that the first time I could meet him. Because until that point, he was in safe houses in the underground on escape. And so we started, yeah. And in that days, in the beginning, there was in a way an idea there is a new generation of indigenous people, young people, who just said, hey, daddy, grandpa, the traditional organizations you did now 15 years, 20 years, 10 years in several countries, not only Ecuador, Guatemala, Brazil. You did all these demonstrations. You did all these petitions to the government, and the result is zero. Mm. They are still destroying our country. They are still robbing our resources. So, so the young generation said, hey, we have to act different. And they began to literally to start to fight, you know. But in the beginning, I mean, I only found three black and white photo pictures of the Shuas, and that was it. There was not one minute of film material or film footage with resistant indigenous resistance fighters anywhere in Latin America. So we started there. And to shorten it up, it was a very long process. They are organized in committees. Yeah. So I had to, in a way, to convince the first level, the second level, the third level, the fourth level, like that. You know, it needed months and months. But in the end, they said, okay, you are allowed to work, you are allowed to film. And the last step was you are allowed to film our militant cell. Uh-huh. And these are the guys with the weapons who are literally yeah. fighting. So... And yeah, you talk with, we can see in the documentary that you, you talk with several of them and you ask them uh, why they chose this path and they explain themselves. And in a way, there was no other way for them uh, but fight. So uh, there, there, there were really, really hard circumstances uh, for them and also probably for you being there. And it's, it's probably really, really dangerous. And in documentary, we see that uh, many people ask Fernando to to just flee away from the country, but, right? But he says, no, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to finish my job and I'm going to be t- here till the end. And also he says mm. that I never been in jail even in one day. So I I mm. reached my goal. Yeah, it was beautiful, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, in general, it's always like that. It's very easy to talk about human rights or stuff yeah. like that or resistance. If you are in a safe house, like now, you know, I'm in Germany, everything is safe. That's very easy. But to live it in the region, I mean, it's critical. Let's take first Fernando. Three times a hitman was sent. A sicario. And it was clear that they wanted to kill him. So one time he he escaped to Lima in Peru. And even they sent a hitman to Lima. So he said, well, if they even try to shoot me in Peru, I can go back home. Because if I want to die anywhere, I want to be in Quito, like that, you know. Paul and Hernan, the same. Three times the mining company, we only have mentioned in the film one time, but three times the mining company has sent killers to kill them, to shoot them. Hernan was going up to Hernan, uh, to Rio Blanco, sorry, to Rio Blanco one time. And all windows of his car were destroyed because they were shooting him, you know. But Hernan is a fighter. He researched who was it and grabbed them. Yeah. He grabbed the killers and made them clear, hey, you are not doing with me. But, yeah. I mean, for them, very critical. And I, I've seen couples where the children, two girls, they were something like six and eight years old. And the couple was discussing, okay. We are two persons, we are two parents. One of us can go into the resistance, but he or she might be killed. So the other one has to stay at home. And it was very interesting. The woman was going into the resistance and the man was staying home, you know. And unfortunately, in that moment, I had no camera because it was a beautiful scene, you know, in front of the kids, how they were discussing it. And, And they said, yeah, and I mean, this passion... You know, how they are saying we are willing to pay the price and they mean it, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that brings, 
brings you in a way back to the attitude of the people to nature. It's totally different from our attitude and our view. I never would say I have lived with them for months over these last four years where we produced the documentary, but I never would say I really have understood them. No, I started to learn. You know, mm -hmm. it's totally different. It's different. And yeah. on a metaphorical level, I would say we too, we have a father and a mother. Fine. You know, and that's it. For them, it's like that. They have a father, a mother, and the nature. Yeah. It's the same level for them. It has the same worth. It's important like a father or a mother. You know, it's totally different from our attitude in Europe to nature. They're and so they are really upset, clear. I mean, if you if you try to imagine somebody is coming and try to kill your father or mother, you would resist too, you know. And in a way, they are doing that. But I really appreciated their passion. And it was a little bit like watching the very young Che Guevara working and fighting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They have a different kind of respect and different kind of relationship with nature, like you said. And like you said before, it's really easy for us to talk from our secure homes, but there is a different kind of reality out there and they're facing that reality. And that was why it affected me so much. Fernando is saying that he will stay there no matter what happens, even though there are so many dang dangerous threats out there. Uh, they chose to stay there and just chose to fight for their home. Yeah, so, in Fernando's case, I mean, there yeah. was a there was a scene and situation. It was heartbreaking. I mean, he went to U.S. Um, Barack Obama was president, mm -hmm. and he gave him political asylum. He learned his case and directly said, "Okay, this guy has asylum. He can live in U.S." And there was a big news company who offered him a job. So. His wife, Veronica, they met the first time since around 10 months on the airport in Bogota, Colombia. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that Fernando has seen his kids again for 10 months. He had never had seen them for 10 months. And Veronica told him, hey, come on, let's go. Let's go to the U.S. You have a mm -hmm. great job offer. We can live there. We are safe, you know. But he refused. He said, no, I'm going back. I have to finish something. And my friends are there. You know, and they will be arrested. Yeah. So I'm going back. And off camera, Veronica told me later, I learned in that moment that the love of my man for his mission is bigger than for me or the family, you know. Yeah. Because that was more important to him. I mean, it's very easy to, as I said in the beginning, it's very easy to talk about it, but to live it, to so know yeah. when you are really in life danger. And, you know, sometimes so I meet now a lot of Q&As on international festivals or hear screenings in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, on every second screening, there's coming the question, hey, Mark, this is dangerous, why are you doing it and stuff like that, mm. you know. And I always like to answer, hey, guys, let me point out one thing very clear. For us, it's a danger of the moment. For them, it's a danger all the time. I can go out. I can go back. I have to return. You can escape. There's always a way for yeah, you. I can always yeah. escape. You know? yeah. It's too dangerous. I'm going out. Yeah. You know? For them, no. I mean, their their land is poisoned by uranium because they did in Rio Blanco they extracted uranium, which is strictly forbidden of by the constitution of Ecuador, strictly forbidden. But they did it, so they are in that. And for Fernando now, there is a development in the last election. He was elected as a member of parliament. He's a politician now and chief of the commission against corruption and stuff like that so but for them i mean rio blanco nothing has changed nothing yeah yeah and i just wanted to ask you i just want to recap for people who haven't seen a documentary yet we can say that we talked about president moreno which is also his laws are, are called Koreaism. and in there is a relationship with china and ecuador that uh, unfortunately ecuador is almost like a colony of china before all this and they were giving all kinds of 
uh, incentives uh, to China. They were mining uh, the contamination of water environments. They were taking oil. Uh, they were uh, changing the infrastructure. There were lots of concessions given to China. And uh, Fernando was the one, right, uh, who um, get all the papers, all the files, and who show the people what's going on, what's what's really going out, on out there. So I just wanted to ask you, you made a documentary about this process. Do you think that this documentary, in a way, internationally, can uh, change things, can make an impact? Uh, I'm not talking about Ecuador right now. I'm talking about internationally, other con countries' point of view. I mean, when you talk with other people, uh, what was... Uh, your idea about their behavior, they respond to the situation? Well, of course, there is an impact, yes. Yeah. Will it change the situation? No. Yeah. I mean, of course not. I yeah. mean, we are talking about China. China is a superpower. You know, yeah. one film is changing nothing. But I always like the metaphorical picture of 1,000 or 1 million pieces you need for the change. Exactly. And the film is just one piece, nothing more. And so you need the others. But, I mean, it's important. I mean, it's important because first for Ecuador, when I was traveling in Ecuador alone and when I was moving alone in Quito, taxi drivers, cab drivers, restaurant people, bar people, coffee people, and I was talking to them and, and they had no slight idea that these Chinese connections, these Chinese contracts were existing, you know? Yeah. For other countries, it's important for the people to see it, you know? That they are, they are able to be critical against their own government before they are starting this, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and even on published level or media level, there are now others like Art of France coming and they ask me, hey, can you do a second documentary where you, in a way, show the influence of China worldwide, not mm. just only Ecuador and stuff like that. So it's important because, you know, you have vulnerable countries like Greece after the 2008 bank crash. Yeah. I mean, they rushed in, but don't take me wrong. You have rich countries too. Canada, Australia, Germany, China is in. Yeah. And one expert told me two years ago, if they would take all money out of the Wall Street, there is a lot of Chinese money in the mm -hmm. whole Wall Street would collapse. Would you know? crash, yeah. And don't take me wrong, I'm, I mean, I'm born 66. So I'm, I'm knowing very, very good what kind of disaster the Western countries, US and CIA has done in Latin America in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but mainly 70s and 80s. You know, I know it. Mm -hmm. But... That's not the point, because you cannot say, okay, that was injustice, and now we can do it too. No. It would it would be the same if you would say today, yeah, it's okay that Putin is attacking Ukraine because uh, the U.S. troops were in Vietnam. No. Both cases are wrong, you know? Yeah. And, but it's complicated, because to leave a little bit the topic of the film, you have other topics like global warming or the corona pandemia, where you see you have to talk with each other, the whole world. It's not functioning, this block building. Now at the moment, because of yeah. the war in the Ukraine, Cold War starting again, block building, rich countries, poor countries. It, you know, it's not working. We need solutions worldwide. We have no other chance. There is no alternative. Exactly. We have to be in, in, in fact, globally, we have to be uh, talking with each other globally. Like you said, we cannot, we cannot go by the rule is everybody by themselves because it won't work. And uh, that's why I ask that. I mean, of course, maybe documentaries won't immediately change everything, but also, but they are in a way for us to talk about these problems and maybe uh, giving people people some ideas, especially the young generation, I guess, are really, mm -hmm. really affected by all these documentaries and all the things that we're talking right now because they're uh, growing by knowing all the world's problems because there's also social media right now and they're able to reach out to many, many um, things going around the world. So. 
I think it's really important what you're doing. And yeah, uh, and I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. you know what? The actions and the reaction has to come by the people. Because yeah. if you take this Corona pandemic, and if I check the behavior of the government, it was absolute disaster and ridiculous. Unfortunately, I have yes. I have the proof with Corona. You had the proof that it spread worldwide. Yeah, that this we are only one country or block is not functioning. Yeah. So what the, and then you have the medicine against it, the vaccine. And what the, did the rich countries? What what have they done? They said it's for us. And Africa and the others are not interesting. We give them some, the rest. You know, it's absolutely yeah. ridiculous because then you have uh, another virus from Africa, another variant virus, and it's spreading back. You know, and so I really think it has to come off the population of the people. Especially, yeah, of course, like always, young generations. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah, and uh, what you did, uh, what you did, and also in Ecuador, and what Fernando did, also, I think, a great example of that by becoming becoming all together and, uh, in a way, opening a path for a big change. And I also wanted to ask: so, can you tell us the audience who? doesn't really know about the subject what happened later on i mean what happened fernanda was able to reach his goal right so the well, government um, changed can yeah, you give information the, the about government, the government changed yeah. yes and but the problem is i give you an example the name of the new president is Guillermo lasso and mm -hmm. my assistant director is a close friend of him so as i arranged a meeting with the lasso and i asked him hey is there a chance to make a second movie how you try to clean up the country of the Chinese uh, contract because yeah. you are the new president, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, no way. He was very open, very direct in that. He said, no way. And then his answer was because I need the Chinese money. Of course, yeah. So even the new government, I mean, the whole country is like handcuffed, you know? Yeah. It's very complicated because the structure of these debts, the structure of the country, contracts, it's, it's like a snowball getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But yeah. the debts are growing and growing and growing because of the conditions. And so, I mean, they are in it. And I mean, the contracts are valid until we sat in the firm until 2024. But mm. they have signed more contracts after we finished the firm. So I guess today it's until... 35, 36, 40, something like that, you know, you have real no big chance. There are small chances, but that would mean that you have other investors. There is only the chance for Western investors, but then China has to agree and they will never agree. They would never, Most yeah. They will yeah. not agree. You have it. I'm now editing the new movie. It's about Venezuela and it's by chance that there are two Latin American countries. It's not that I'm focused on Latin America, but because you have the democracy is just destroyed in Venezuela, you know? And so we went into one favela, barrio, poor neighborhood and filmed there one year. And it's the same situation. The Western countries said, no, it's a left-wing government. We are not giving you money. And China and Russia stepped in like hell. And of course they are not going out now, you know? In Venezuela, yeah. you have this opposition politician, politician, Guaido, and the whole West, and Germany said he's the new president, and it was ridiculous. And I always said I want to see that he's winning, because the first thing which has to happen is that China is agreeing, but they never agreed to him. So it's complicated. Yeah. And yeah. But the real, real bad thing is, and that's in a way it's the meta level of my film, I mean, I, I'm showing how a superpower is playing chess, you know? And Ecuador is just one figure. First. They're just playing with a whole country, and that's shocking in a way. But that's what they are doing. And that's what is America is doing too, by the way. And I totally dislike that. Because under the bottom line, it's bad for the people. Under the bottom line, it means more poverty for the people. And sorry to say it, but under the bottom line, people are dying because of that. Yeah, there are lots of human rights invasions.
because mm. of these situations and we always talk about human rights but uh, as we spoke before uh, it, we are just talking about that uh, yeah maybe we can prevent some of these violations uh, but also there are many many others that we cannot pre prevent right now and these violations happening every day in in most of the countries every day so uh, happening every day and yeah. you know I mean, it's like that. If you take this, for example, just take an example, you have debts of $5 billion, you know, but the interest rates are much too high, you know. That means the country has to give too much back and then the resources are underpriced. So under the bottom line, and you have the corruption, under the bottom line, it means the government has no money. And that means the government is not able to help the poor people. That means that hundreds or thousands of these people are starving and dying, full stop. And you had it in the pandemia, you have it now. They have additional to that kind of problem. They have an extremely narco problem at the moment in Ecuador. So the narco organization Sinaloa Cartel, Nueva Cartel, Zeta Cartel from Mexico and Colombia flooded the country. At the moment, the Coast city Guayaquil is more violent, more criminal than Tijuana in Mexico. It's the most dangerous city in the whole continent. You know, they're killing like hell. You are not able to go out if it's dark and stuff like that. So yeah. it's complicated. Yeah, it's 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 really complicated, and it's it, it, these issues are, are not really possible to uh, just solve in one day. It would take years and years of. Uh, planning and uh, really, really, uh, there should be willing to do that. And also, like you said, there are lots of economical and political aspects. So, but even though um, people like you and people like Fernando are trying to tell the world something, and I think it counts and it's it's really, really important. So also this interview was really, really interesting for me because uh, we talked about a lot of things, not just the film, and I think it was really, really precious. So thank you so much Thanks. for being here with us today, Mark. No and, problem. Um, do, do you want to add anything else? Um, you can. No, everything's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you again for this okay. important documentary, and I hope many, many pe will, people will reach out to it uh, through our festival too, because I believe not many people know what, know about this subject. Like I said, especially the young generation. So I'm hopeful that. No, they I'm, can... I'm really thankful for platforms like that because that's a chance for us filmmakers to spread our work into the world. You know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you and so as much. As much as possible. And especially, I mean, of course, of course, I'm interested to go on the big festivals, which are well known, of course, you know, because that's good for selling. No, no doubt. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, let's be honest, it's like that. I yeah. mean, if you are ITFA or CPH Dogs and Dog Aviv and this stuff, and we've been there, so it's cool. But I really like the small festivals too because you are coming into other regions. I, we've been in Sarajevo, yeah. we've been in Norway, and, and and I had another movie this camp 14. We've been in Nairobi, Africa, and Delhi and stuff like that, and Beirut, Lebanon. I like it. I like it very much, you know. Not yeah. only to focus on Berlinale and that and that, the traditional ones. So thanks a lot for well, that. It's, and it's great to hear that, and thank you again for joining us today. Have a nice day in Istanbul. Ciao. You too. Bye.